Okay, well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another um, parliamentary conversation on behalf of the European Parliament Liaison Office here in Washington and the former members of Congress Association Congressional Study Group. We want to welcome all of you today. And really, this is a, I can't think of a more appropriate day to have this conversation. President Biden is making his first visit uh, outside our country to Europe. Um, there has been an announcement of a, an agreement on the Airbus Boeing uh, disagreement that's been going on for a while. Susan's happy about that. Susan's from Washington. <laughs> and also, uh, I'm particularly uh, pleased uh, that, the U, that the EU-US Trade and Tech mm -hmm. Council uh, has been announced. Uh, I know that was a, a, a big interest for the Europeans. Uh, it will help to promote joint standards around emerging technologies, better uh, police the digital world. So we're off to a, a good start. Um, this morning, uh, I would like, to, well, I guess I should say, first of all, my name is Bart Gordon. I was a member of the United States Congress for 26 years. I am now on the board of the former members of the Congress Association. I'm going to introduce our panelists. And since I'm the oldest one here, I'm gonna use their first names. I'll take that privilege. Um, and then we will open up with, um, you know, a minute or two of, of conversation from each of our panelists. And then at 40 after the hour, uh, we will open up for uh, questions from the audience. And so down at the bottom of your panel, there should be a question and answer uh, button. And so you can use that to um, send in any of your um, uh, questions. So first of all, we have US Representative Susan Del Benny, as I say, of Washington State. Uh, Susan is on the Ways and Means Committee and on the Trade Subcommittee. And you have all of their full um, uh, bios that was sent to you earlier, so I'm going to be brief so we don't take their time. Um, Member of Parliament, um, Christelle Schoudemoss, uh, is a Social Democrat from Denmark and a member and, uh, uh, and the Rapporteur for the European Parliament Digital, Digital Service Act. Uh, Representative Daryl Issa of uh, from California is a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the, and the House Judiciary Committee. And he's the ranking member on the subcommittee on courts, intellectual property, and the internet. And uh, finally, the member of parliament, Andres Schwab, is from the center-right EPP party from Germany and is a tour for the European Parliament Digital Markets Act. So why don't we'll go in that order and for opening statements. So Susan, please start. Thanks, Bart, and um, thanks to FMC and the Congressional Study Groups and the European Parliamentary Liaison Office for hosting this event and for inviting me to be here. This is a really important topic um, and something I'm personally very passionate about. I've um, been very focused on updating our country's technology policies um, since I joined Congress and um, especially uh, think that we have a lot of work to do around personal data privacy. Uh, it's really critically important that the United States and other like-minded allies work together to create a set of high standards for the use of existing and emerging technologies. And we have work to do right here at home um, to catch up because um, we're behind. Um, we need to make sure we have strong domestic policies as well as engage um, internationally. So I believe the US and the EU should work together to develop rules that align our shared values of preserving and protecting privacy and civil liberties while also fostering economic growth um, and so I've been uh, outspoken um, on the need for the United States to enact a federal privacy law. Um, I've authored legislation, the Information Transparency and Personal Data Control Act um, to set a strong national standard to protect our most personal information and to bring the US into harmony with um, GDPR in some respects and, and help participate as we set global standards. So again, thanks so much for having me here today. I look forward to hearing from others and the ongoing conversation on these important topics. Thanks. Christelle? Also from my side, thank you very much for uh, making this seminar uh, webinar possible. I think it's a great opportunity here in the European Parliament, where I'm a rapporteur on the Digital Service Act, we have uh, just started our work and I think it's really timely to have this discussion transatlantic. I believe that we can learn very much from each other. And I also think that we need to find the common uh, solutions, uh, how to 
adjust and regulate algorithms and privacy and liability for platforms, et cetera, et cetera. We are very, you're very uh, happy with many of the platforms that has come and raised from the United States. We use them every day, uh, many of us, but we also think that they have an impact on our society in a way that makes it necessary for us to go in and regulate, uh, not too heavily, but we need to regulate in order to make sure that we also have a democratic control with it. But I think that we can do a lot of things together. So I'm really thrilled about this opportunity to discuss transatlantic. So thank you very much. And I'm looking very much forward to our discussion today. Carol? Well, you know, it's, uh... As a former member of the former members of Congress, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to thank you for hosting this. Uh, you know, for those two years, I got to really begin to appreciate the work that you do and, and sort of as a sustaining body. Uh, so in addition to the current members of our two respective parliaments, uh, uh, we're, we're really blessed to have an organization that works even after leaving office. Uh, what I'm most interested in today is that I, I believe that the hybrid of our two societies of the European Union and the United States can give us something that we cannot get all by ourselves. Today, members of Congress find it almost impossible to rein in abuses uh, in the FISA statute that exists in the United States. We also find it so far pretty impossible to dig into the algorithms that at least the conservative party believes have been used uh, to censor them. Uh, so it, it does give us an opportunity to explore those two issues. The one thing that I think that we can do most constructively, and I hope that we, we touch on today, even though it's not in the formal questions, is the, the basic concept that these private companies, and I will include the Chinese companies as though they are more private than perhaps they are, but these private companies exist for the public good. And in the generations before us, we looked at private companies such as television uh, broadcasters, and we made them live by a set of rules while private that made them exist for the public good. I believe that we have to find a, a similar compromise for private companies who convey to for the public whether it's in social media, uh, internet communication, or the like. And I, I hope that uh, in addition to everything on the agenda, we get to those kinds of, of futuristic uh, thoughts by looking at the past. Thank you. Andres? Thank you so much, Bart. And thank you uh, also to the APRO people that have been uh, organizing that, that meeting. I think it's, as you said already, Bart, in your introduction, a very timely moment um, to discuss together what links us in relation to these challenges and what we can do together. And I have to tell you, um, my report is already on the table since a while, but I'm um, at the moment about reading the American Innovation and Choice Online Act. I'm reading the Platform Competition and Opportunity Act, and I'm reading also the Ending Platform Monopolies Act that are at that moment uh, as bipartisan legislation brought into Congress. <coughs> And whatever we can do to link the laws that we are about to legislate together, it would be uh, great. Because what we have in common is that the companies that are there in Europe or in the US, they are all bound by the rule of law. We can be sure that if we pass laws, they will be obliged to respect them. And I have no doubt that the people that will deal with these laws will respect them. And that's what links the United States of America and the European Union in difference to other areas of the world. And therefore, I think we should get it right and we should get it right together. And I think me and myself and, and also Crystal, we are here to discuss on that basis with you what you uh, think would be crucial uh, in this legislation to be done to make sure that we are uh, riding the same wave. So thank you so much for the invitation. I'm looking forward to the debate. Okay, well, we're gonna sort of get off script here and just get some things done. Susan and, and Christelle, you both mentioned about privacy. So I want y'all to have a conversation about um, what are those common denominators and, um, and, and how, let's just settle this right now. What, how, how should this be done? What would, what's your suggestion, Suzanne? And then Christelle, why don't you uh, respond to her? Um, so I think, first of all, um, we have to start off by having a U.S. policy 
Um, in the absence of having a US policy, it's hard for us to have a voice at the international table on specifically what we wanna see move forward. And so I think data privacy is an issue of civil rights, civil liberties and human rights. Um, I think in the US, we have to not only establish consumer data privacy um, across the country, some of our states have moved, but I think we need strong federal policy. Um, we have to talk about how we're going to enforce that policy. That's another piece of my legislation is making the Federal Trade Commission the enforcement authority and rulemaking authority. Um, and I believe that we need to be proactive. A uh, part of my legislation also is audit. Um, I don't think, and we talk about how we have good um, kind of privacy and I'd say security hygiene in organizations, I think audit is an important part because then you're not just waiting for something to go wrong. Um, you're actually building in kind of a, a culture of looking at things, giving folks feedback, especially as folks are trying to um, learn how to follow um, new standards that are being set. And so um, I think all of those are important for, for us in the United States to start out to have policy. And I think that also a key part of policy is understanding what it's like for our smallest businesses. We're big innovators. We wanna make sure that innovation can continue to thrive. And so all of those are core pieces, um, something that um, again, that were issues that we talked about as I was putting together legislation too. But then we have to come up with um, uh, um, a collective policies. I think the, the European Court of Justice decision on the privacy shield really shows how important it is for us to be aligned um, for the for for there to be a not only a federal standard here in the U.S. but for there to be um, a good cross border agreement as well, so that we can make sure because this isn't just a technology issue. I think the one thing that we all have to think about is that. A lot of these issues cross so many different industries. Um, these become foundational issues. And, um, and so I think that's all gonna be critically important. But I think, again, we need to have strong domestic policy is a hugely important place to start. So Christelle, how would you respond to that? Well, uh, uh, first of all, thank you, Susan. I think it looks uh, and sounds uh, really great. Uh, we have already in, in EU done uh, a lot when it comes to privacy. Uh, we have a very strong GDPR legislation uh, in place, even though I, I, I still question whether we are able to enforce it in a, in a good manner. But I think that we have a discussion also around DSA and DMA on, on whether it works sufficiently and what we can do. So, so I think that, uh, I mean, it's good that you are moving uh, in a direction where you also look more into privacy questions when it comes to, to the big tech companies and how they, they use our data. We will continue to look at that in, in EU. We have a discussion about the business models of many of the platforms. Uh, you know, uh, they harvest a lot of data. And of course, uh, the consumers has uh, as a principle given consent, uh, otherwise they were not on, on the platform. But can we do more to give consumers more uh, tools to, to adjust and, and have more control of their own uh, personal uh, data? Uh, also, when it comes to recommended systems, algorithms, etc., uh, I think that in many ways we have to look into whether the, this work. One of the discussions we are going to have in the parliament uh, here in Europe is uh, whether we should um, minimize uh, the use of targeted uh, advertising uh, advertisement uh, on the platforms. Uh, uh, they use the profiling from Facebook and others uh, to, to make this micro-targeting. This is a discussion in, in, in EU. We haven't solved it yet. We haven't found solutions yet. We are still in the beginning of, of a debate. But I think that maybe it could be very good if we together discussed how can we create a, a real trustworthy uh, online environment, uh, also when it comes to protecting your uh, personal data, but at the same time, not hampering innovation and still give uh, opportunities for, for, uh, for companies and medias, et cetera, to, to use uh, the ben, uh, ben, uh, get, get benefits from, from the uh, platforms, et cetera. So I think we need to discuss and, and work together on how we solve this. And the best thing we can do is probably to align our legislation in the way, I know it's difficult because we have different uh, legislative regimes, but align them in, 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 in a good manner could be useful because otherwise we end up with double systems. We had the European ones and then we had the American ones and, and then they have to comply with, with two different ways of tackling this and then it becomes 
unfortunately uh, bureaucratic and, and I, I'm sure that that's neither the interest of, of the companies nor the, the users and the consumers. So we have to do more and look into this uh, and, and adjust it a bit, uh, but on the other hand also making sure that we are not hampering uh, innovation. That is how I look at it. Thanks. You know, that reminds me that when the United States first had its coast-to-coast uh, -coast railroad, they started at each end, but then they wound up at the same place. You know, it would certainly be not a good thing for Europe or the U.S. if we ended up at different places. And just as a thought, uh, I was chairman of the Science, Space, and Technology when I was a member of Congress. And uh, I had a delegation that came over from the uh, uh, from the... Uh, the UK Parliament Science Committee. And we said, well, why don't we do something together? And so we took a, a, a project, it was geoengineering. And we had joint hearings and made a joint recommendation. And uh, it, it was unofficial, um, but that might be something that your committee and, and, and Congress could work together on something like that. Um, Darryl, Can I jump in just one, one thing real quickly? We have the, this issue internally in the US, right? We already have two different state laws that are not the same. Um, so I think it's important for us to think about what our federal law looks like, because it's hard to have a conversation between the US and the EU if we potentially have 50 different state um, privacy laws that um, aren't consistent. Um, so I, Christelle's point is important. I think we have to deal with that domestically right now. That's a good point. And you know, this, I was very pleased that the Trade and Technology Council has been created. But as a former parliamentarian, uh, I don't want to see that just be the executive branch. And I hope that um, Congress and the parliament will be involved in the tech and, and, and your voices will be heard there. Now, Daryl raised an interesting, uh, Daryl is a conservative guy. And, and so here he's talking about uh, sort of uh, the federal government uh, to some extent, regulating the private industry. Well, you know, that's not what you would normally think that Daryl would be saying. But as he pointed out, uh, private businesses that have this, you know, uh, amount of impact on our lives uh, have a have a, a public uh, role. Why don't you, Daryl, explain more how you would like to see that happen, and then let's let let Andres um, respond to that. Well, I think one of the important issues is, and we talk about algorithms. Uh, when a private company purports to be fair, then they and and they affect tens of millions or in in some cases billions of people. Uh, there becomes a question of if uh, and uh, Susan has uh, done a good job. Suzanne has done a good job of saying the Federal Trade Commission might, in fact, in the U.S. regulate this. The Federal Trade Commission has a mandate in the United States to verify that, in fact, unfair trade practices, misleading or false uh, advertising and the like are regulated in this country. And really, all I'm saying is, is that when you put yourself out and you say, here is our standard, let's just say Facebook, we're an open platform without a bias. Well, that's fine. But then the government has a role to say, if you're going to say that, it has to be verified. And that's really where that in between comes. Now, that does leave open as a conservative, an organization to say, we are not open, we are not transparent, we have a bias, and we only want X or Y. I think there's a freedom to do that. I suspect there will be very few whose business models will claim that. Uh, even Fox in the United States uh, famously says, you know, fair and balanced, uh, even while being right leaning. So I suspect that we'll have very few takers who would want to decline that type of oversight if uh, we around the world said, well, you can, if you claim it, your algorithm has to be analyzed to verify that it's true. And so, Daryl, would you say to the Europeans that they have the right to also to look at American companies? Uh, to for that um, to validate their claims? Well, I think that to the extent that their citizens are participating, in other words, when a platform becomes open in a particular country, they're doing business in that country, they have a nexus in that country, and that begins to make a fair 
regulatory oversight. Now, the one challenge we have in the internet is we cannot have 200 completely separate regimes. And I think that's where we as parliamentarians representing, if you will, a large portion of the world, we can in fact create standards so that when a country says, well, I wanna look into this, they can do so based on a set of standards that are already widely accepted so that Facebook, Google, whoever can comply without an unreasonable burden. And, and I think that is important. And the same could be said of SAP or anybody else. It, it's not one country specific. So Daryl, when you say Nexus, uh, does uh, Facebook have to have a footprint in Denmark or just if it's being used in Denmark, is that enough of a Nexus? Well, I think the, uh, and I don't want to use the Chinese model, but sometimes it's worth referencing them. The Chinese recognize that if you, if they feel you're not doing something to their standards, they simply block you. Uh, every country on the internet has the right to determine whether a company can do business in their country. So to the extent that you port in, you have sufficient nexus for that country to decide whether or not you can do business. And, and obviously we wanna, we wanna recognize that the internet succeeds because very few are blocked in the Western world. Uh, but if I, can, if I can do one thing, Bart, uh, I just wanna take 10 seconds to prove I'm a conservative and read you something. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. For us as parliamentarians, that serenity prayer has to be our guidance because there are a lot of things we cannot change. We cannot change overnight the behavior of China. We cannot stop those who will scrape data from the internet from owning that data, even after we say that it somehow magically is supposed to disappear. We can make the original source turn it back in we can't control those entities that have, have harvested that data. And so I think as we go through these things, we've got to ask, what is it we have the power to agree on and actually implement? And what is it that is probably nice to have, but it's simply not going to happen? Our, For example, our intelligence agencies are not going to respect a law that says you won't spy on another country. Uh, we certainly have seen this in both in all of our nations. So I, I think we have to be realistic in the laws we pass. Well, that opens up a sensitive uh, situation for Andres. Uh, all countries are obviously interested in privacy. I think Germany particularly uh, values their privacy. So uh, Andres, how would you uh, respond uh, to Daryl's uh, position o or overall, his overall comments? No, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very positively impressed how close uh, we are. And the, the positive thing behind all this is that we in Europe would generally trust that if the Americans investigate um, a system will uh, have an overview about a, a, a company, that that will be rather more or less exactly the same results being there as it's done in Europe. There might be some elements between that are different between Denmark and Germany for historical reasons. Uh, that's rather in the area of the scope of the law that Crystal deals with, because in Germany, you may know that there is a criminal law that prohibits people to speak out about the Holocaust not having existed. In other countries of the world, this is allowed because you cannot make laws against the stupidity of people. In Germany, we have done for specific historical reasons. And we would like that this remains respected, although uh, we know the limits of that legislation as well. But there are other uh, elements um, where we exactly come to the same conclusions. And this is what links us in a, in a unique way and what we have to build on. And in difference uh, to the proposal where we speak about uh, data privacy or freedom of speech, in the area of the monopolies, we have federal power in the European Union and we have also some federal power in the US. And therefore, I believe very strongly that if we get it right here together, we can really go for a best practice model in the world. And we know that the Japanese, the Indonesians, and others are already looking on what we are doing. 
And if we do it together, there can be also a speed, a transatlantic speed for other countries to join us. And with the arguments that uh, Daryl has used, making sure that innovation is kept at the highest level in our economies. And that makes profiting all citizens and all businesses, uh, by the way, also in the US. And therefore, I think we have a unique chance to do it uh, uh, together. We will not be able to do every word together, but the, the main reflection can be the same. We are based on the same values. And like that, I think also the outcome can be very uh, close. I think there is only one little element of discussion that will remain compared to what Daryl has said. I think it's true that if a company, as he has said, if a company is claiming that it's neutral with the results they are offering, there should be some sort of uh, control that this is also corresponding to the facts. Um, and the more neutral it is, the better for innovation and the better for the economies, because the better our systems uh, can become. And therefore, I think uh, um, we should really look together what we can now do uh, in uh, Congress and in the European Parliament. But it's also true that the governments, the European Commission and the federal uh, government in the US have to work together on that. I, I have just heard that Vestager uh, and the FTC chairman have been already speaking several times. I'm very confident that that will be going further. Uh, and therefore, um, I think we have now to start to work together uh, in concrete terms. Well, you, what you're talking about is mutual recognition, and uh, which would be a wonderful place if we can um, uh, get to that level. Uh, Daryl raised the issue about China. Uh, as Suzanne knows, you can't sit down in Washington and have a conversation that China doesn't come up in some regard, whether it is uh, competition uh, or uh, security. And so let's talk a little bit about that, because I know that's what... Uh, our leaders are talking about in Brussels now is how can we work together with our shared uh, values um, to rein in some of the bad behavior of China. Uh, Suzanne, do you, would you like to enter, enter that conversation? Certainly, um, I think that we need high, to set high standards um, in the digital world and to set those high standards, those high global standards is gonna be really important for us as like-minded partners to come together. And um, because if we can set that standard, that has a huge impact uh, around the globe. Um, the, the, in the absence of that, we allow others to help set those standards and or standards become very um, bifurcated and there is no strong global standard. And I think that um, that makes it really challenging for there to be really strong um, not only rules of the road, but strong uh, support for common values, um, values for civil rights, civil liberties, human rights. Um, and, and so we talk about what's happening today. I think it's really important that we have a long-term view. Innovation happens quickly and um, policy doesn't always. So I do think that it's going to be important for us to not only engage and I think the Trade and Technology Council is a great idea and I'm excited that there's going to be a movement there. Um, but I also think that we have to realize that technology is, you know, there's a lot of talk about certain companies. I really think that these are foundational issues that go um, and um, that many parts of our economy are built on. We talk about broadly about technology, even about um, consumer data, it's not just big tech companies that have um, consumer data, right? It's, um, it's all sorts of industries. I think it's gonna be important for us to engage and discuss what those um, policies are gonna be going forward. And again, for from the, I feel like in the United States, we've been behind in making sure that we're clear on our domestic policy. Um, and that's going to be it, that's critically important for us to have a strong voice as we have uh, you know as we discuss at the international level, and so to really jointly move forward, we've got to be clear um, what we think is going to be important in terms of um, policy that will also work in the U.S. And I think that's something I talk about privacy a lot, but I think it's important for us because I think privacy is pretty foundational. Um, it kind of underpins issues like facial recognition, um, like AI, et cetera. And so I feel like that's a strong starting point and why I've been pushing so hard on privacy specifically 
um, as a federal policy. Andres, as we talk about sort of mutual recognition, what is sort of your um, your red line uh, in in your that you just couldn't cross? And uh, is there something that you see that that the Americans are doing uh, that would be hard for you to swallow? I mean, I speak as a politician, but I have to tell you that I don't see any uh, red line that we couldn't cross together. Uh, I mean, what we stand for is strong and innovative markets that are based on the merit of the idea and of the, of the business and not of any intrusion uh, uh, of, of outsiders um, and that defend um, 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 in an open and, and uh, competitive economy uh, the best results uh, that are there for the clients. Um, and that is something that we are 100% aligned. And I think that's also a bit the dividing line in relation to third countries in the world that are also in that area growing. Um, and therefore, I think we have to give a very clear signal together that the globalized world will only be successfully uh, um, surviving if we are all the time putting uh, the, 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 the point on the winner that has based his business on its merits and not on any fake idea behind. And I think we have been seeing in the last uh, 10, 15 years, amazing examples of uh, entrepreneurial uh, success um, that have shaped and improved the life of citizens and of businesses. Uh, and I think you can be proud that a lot of them, nearly all of them came uh, from the US and we should endeavor to improve that even uh, that there are more American companies and also some Europeans and also Chinese and others to join us there, but based all on strong values of fair competition uh, and of uh, transparency where it's needed and, and always based on the merits of the idea. Well, Daryl, um, Andrus mentioned the American companies, and many of those came from your state. Uh, are they too big? Does something need? Do they need to be broken up? Do they need to have uh, more of a harness put around them? What do you think? Well, I don't think they need to be broken up uh, per se. Uh, there's always the question of you know whether it's Microsoft up in Suzanne's neck of the wood, uh, or many of the Silicon Valley companies uh, that are doing acquisitions in some cases at a rate of greater than one a day. There's some real questions about whether acquisitions have become an anti-competitive system for these large companies with large market share. And so I certainly would support that in the US that uh, uh, the Hart Scott Rodino, these kinds of evaluations uh, not be performa anymore, but that we take a good look at companies with large market share to see whether or not they are essentially maintaining that market share by buying companies up before they can be competitors. Setting that aside, I think, again, if we look at the history of one after another company being seen as unstoppable, I, I'm old enough that I remember companies like SuperCalc and VisiCalc. Uh, nobody remembers those spreadsheet formats anymore, but there was a time when they and uh, Word Perfect and other names of the past dominated the market with 70, 80% or greater market share. So I don't believe that technology has, has shown that there's such a thing as a permanent monopoly. But I do think that well companies have large market share, they have to be viewed from a standpoint of accountability and anti-monopolistic behavior. And that's actually where the United States has very strong laws but those very strong laws need to be enforced. And I think we in the legislative branch have to remember that just because we pass a law doesn't mean the executive branch with full faith executes it. I've certainly seen the Federal Trade Commission and uh, Department of Justice, let's just say that uh, acting late or not at all in some cases, and we need to be more aggressive there. Christelle, you are the rapporteur for the Digital Service Act. Tell us what uh, is most important uh, in that act to you. Thank you very much for that question. But before I answer that, I <laughs> might come up with one comment on China as well, if you allow me. Certainly. Uh, because certainly. I think, I think that, th thanks. Because I, I just think, I just want to say that, uh, you know, with your last president, uh, 
when we saw that uh, when when EU and and United States didn't go hand in hand, for instance, on climate actions. We saw that we had to join up with the Chinese side in order to make sure that something happened on a global scale. And, and this, is, this is why I'm so happy that you got a new president, uh, because I think that now together we can uh, join forces again. And I think we need to do that when it comes to digitalization, artificial intelligence and other things, because if we do it together, we can set the global standards. And, but that, that means that we have to do it together because otherwise the Chinese will do it. Uh, so I think the lesson learned from the past is that if we don't join forces, we will not be able to control the development. So therefore it is so important. However, back to the DSA. Well, I think that there are many, many good questions uh, that are important for us here from the European side. Uh, uh, I think that we need to discuss uh, uh, liability on online marketplaces because uh, I, I, I use the sentence that what is illegal offline should also be legal online. Uh, we have a lot of good legislation in place for the offline world, uh, level playing field for companies, product safety for consumers, etc. And I think that we should have that uh, working also online. And here I'm not sure that the proposal from the Commission goes far enough. So I think that we need to look into how the online marketplaces do more in order to make sure that what is sold online on their platforms are, uh, are safe. They need to, they, they are exempted from liability here in, 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 U, in EU, but also in the US. But in order to benefit from this uh, exemption from, for, from liability, I think that they knew, need to do more. So I, I'm looking into that. I also think that we should do something um, about the algorithms. I think we need to uh, have a higher level of transparency, but also accountability uh, on uh, the algorithms for, for, the big, for, the, for the platforms. And uh, therefore, I think that we need to give researchers access to, uh, first of all, it's about making sure that the platforms uh, are doing what they're saying they're doing. Uh, and, and therefore, they need to be accountable. And we need to give researchers access to uh, checking the algorithms of course, authorities, but maybe even civil society in order to help making sure that they, that they are doing what they are supposed to, to do. And then we need to have discussions around uh, consequences uh, for the platforms on democracy. Uh, you have had discussions about the fact that Twitter and Facebook closed down uh, Mr. Trump's uh, account. Uh, um, is that fair or not? We're going, we are having the same discussion here in, in Europe, and I think we need to find the balance between uh, the right to speak freely, but also creating a trustworthy environment online so people dare go into a discussion online because they, you know, the big platforms have become public spaces and therefore we need to create a trustworthy online environment. We know from surveys in Denmark that many women, they don't want to be active uh, on the social media because or uh, enter into a democratic discussion because they fear uh, the tone, the reaction from, from others online. And I think that we need to discuss how we tackle this. So that's some of the many, many, many discussions I think that is important for me when it comes to DSA. And we haven't found all the solutions yet. We're still uh, in discussion mode, but I think that we need to make sure that the platforms are doing more to create a safe uh, online environment and that they do more also to, to make sure that that goods sold online is as safe as it would be if it was sold offline. Interestingly, we're having that same discussion right now in the United States. Um, let, you know, let's turn now to our to questions. Uh, Patrick, do you want to read some of the questions that have come in? Yes, thank you, Bart. And again, I encourage all our audience members, if they have any questions for our distinguished panel, to please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, our first question, um, just today, digital trade negotiations at the WTO had to be revised as the US considered that agreed positions were considered too old fashioned. Now a new round of negotiations is needed. What can members of Congress and the European Parliament do to facilitate this WTO process? Would anyone like to take that? I'll start us off. Um, first of all, I think uh, digital trade is a critically important issue and sometimes hasn't been discussed enough. Um, we're a party to a digital trade agreement in USMCA, but that's uh, the, and we had discussions, but that's the, the first chap, digital chapter in a trade agreement the US is a signatory of. And, um, and so I do think that 
it's very important that we have a focus on digital trade issues of cross border data flow, some of the things we talked about um, before I helped uh, start up the digital trade caucus here in Congress, another way to remind people of these issues, the impact they have, not just on technology, but on so many sectors. Um, so I think one way we engage in this is by making sure we're all, you know, discussing strong policies here. And again, it's kind of setting those standards from a trade perspective and we're working with the WTO. Anyone else like to respond? Okay, Patrick. Before, to before we move on, I, uh, because it was alluded to and I, and I think it's an important subject. One of the pieces of legislation that is going to be difficult to get through but that we're working on is called the uh, Shop Safe Bill here in Congress. And it really uh, goes right uh, uh, to that question of safety uh, of online products versus, if you will, brick and mortar. I, I think we all understand that both here and throughout Europe, uh, a tremendous amount of counterfeits are sold online. Often those counterfeits include cosmetics, medicines, vitamins, uh, in addition to children's toys. And currently there's not really a good enforcement mechanism to challenge uh, and hold accountable the platforms. Uh, in theory, you can, uh, you can go after a company, and I hate to keep saying China, but they're the source of a lot of it. You can go after a company somewhere deep in China that's selling fake cosmetics, and that's, uh, that's a fool's errand. You're, there's nothing there, you're not gonna succeed. Uh, so the only recourse you have, at least on a repetitive uh, infringer, uh, is to hold the platforms responsible to, uh, to use their ability as a partner in the, uh, in the process uh, to, uh, to vet these companies or at least to cancel them if it's shown that they are in fact uh, repeatedly selling counterfeits or unsafe goods. So I think that's an area where the US and Europe should be able to harmonize uh, some form each with our own enforcement but it's the only way we're gonna take on this massive amount of unsafe counterfeits. All right, Patrick, why don't you um, uh, read the second question, please? Absolutely. Um, we have a question. So while USA and EU formulate joint policies, at what point should we draw in like-minded countries such as the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and others? Let's see, uh, Christelle, you sort of opened that, that box a little earlier. Why don't you uh, take or start that question? Well, if I understood it correctly, I, I think that it is extremely important that we uh, have a dialogue with uh, many different uh, uh, states, uh, na nations around uh, the world. And of course, those we trade mostly with, we should have a very close uh, relationship to and, and also have a dialogue when it comes to uh, legislative uh, initiatives. Uh, well, in, in EU, we have lately uh, uh, the last years since the Doha round uh, did not really function when it comes to international trade. Uh, we have had uh, made a lot of uh, trade agreements, uh, bilateral trade agreements with uh, many different countries throughout uh, the world. And, and we, we are also now doing one with UK, uh, you know, uh, United uh, Kingdom left uh, the European Union. So we had to make a trade agreement, but we are also working on other trade agreements uh, globally. And I think that in that we also have to discuss uh, digital uh, questions uh, besides workers' conditions and environmental questions, etc. So in EU, at least, we are doing this uh, very formally with very formal uh, uh, economic partnership agreements in, in, in one way or the other. We just uh, a couple of years ago made one with Japan, uh, where we also included a, a strategic partnership agreement wanting to have a very close relationship. And we have, as you know, also have had a discussion whether we should have one with the United States. Uh, it started uh, the TTIP and, and it, 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 it ended with no result. But I mean, that has been the European uh, approach to this lately that we made uh, bilateral uh, trade agreements. But, but of course, I would, I would wish that we could uh, do more uh, globally uh, and, and that it not, did not have to be so much bilateral, but that we could uh, get the international trade system to work again. But, but I'm, I'm not, 
very optimistic when it comes to that. Um, I was going to add that we uh, actually, in our digital trade caucus, bipartisan digital trade caucus, we actually just had a meeting um, with ambassadors from Japan, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, because again, I think we have the ability to collaborate with like-minded partners. And this is, uh, so these conversations are happening and we have an agreement with Japan as well. So um, I think that this isn't a, um, this is kind of a, an ongoing effort across the board to continue these relationships and have these uh, conversations moving forward to address these issues. Um, and maybe I can piggyback on to that uh, a direct answer to the question, uh, not just should we uh, view Australia, New Zealand, Japan uh, to be included, but I think a little bit like the original intent of the G7, the G20, and so on, uh, when it comes to trade and to digital trade, I, I think there are two, two uh Two things that, that go together that I don't want to sound uh, elitist, but a sophisticated economy, a first world economy, and a open and transparent uh, uh, democracy, if you will, if you take the two of those, you can select the countries that need to be members of, if you will, this decision process or club. And that includes certainly Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, Japan, uh, because they meet both of those criteria that they will follow the rule of law, they're predictable uh, uh, economies, but also predictable governments. And I think that's where you can view China, not be because of its economic level, but because of its rule of law, they don't fit the club, no matter how advanced they become as an economy. So I do think that there's an, a real need to invite everyone who fits that two-pronged test. Well, when the US and the EU get together, you've got half the world's GDP, so that's a good start. It does, and, uh, but you know, just as the five eyes, Bart, you'll remember, uh, we wouldn't want to exclude com countries oh, just because they're geographically challenged in the Southern Hemisphere. Andres, do you have anything you would like to add to that conversation? I mean, it's obvious that there are other countries in the world, lots of other countries that feel inspired by the, by the American uh, legislation uh, because uh, the United States are uh, uncontestably the leader of the free world. Um, and they would like to have, uh, we would like to be taken into consideration. And so for example, Japan or, or Indonesia are also great and big countries or India or others, but uh, they are not, we are not able to discuss legislation at that much broad level. So if we work together, I think these countries can also follow that talks and they will for sure take ownership of that. Um, I'm, for example, already invited to lots of meetings also with the Japanese. They have taken over the general data protection regulation. They have taken over the network and information security, the cybersecurity legislation. So these laws, if they are done well, they will create interest with people that are thinking like us. And there are more people in the world, I'm deeply convinced about that, that live, uh, that want to govern with freedom and with liberty than others. So if we do it rightly together, we have a chance also to have a positive impact into the world of the digital 21st century. And that's, I think, what we have to aim for. Patrick, one more question, then we're gonna let the panelists uh, have closing comments. Sounds great. Um, specifically, one question about uh, TTC, the EU-US Trade and Technology Council about a possible parliamentary input. Uh, might our members share what ought to be the priorities for any such parliamentary input if an opportunity arose for such an input? Suzanne, you wanna start? Well, um, I actually think uh, input's gonna be critical and I hope there is an important role that um, um, both uh, from the EU side and from uh, the United States for uh, legislators to be involved and engaged. One, um, if I give the example um, that I've been using over and over, uh, our domestic policy has a big impact on, um, on the collaboration that we would have in these areas. And so I do think it's important for legislators who are working on those policies 
to be involved in those conversations as we look um, for what we can do together. And we talk about kind of having these shared high standards. It's important that we um, we're engaged because that's going to reflect what we're also doing um, domestically, what's happening within the EU um, for those to all really be in harmony. So I do think that that engagement is going to be important. Well, I hope that Congress will remind the administration that Congress is the one that writes the check uh, for um, and that um, you know you will say that you would want your part of you, uh, or your your say in that take. It's important. Well, and we also write the laws, so I think in this case that's also <laughs> fair. <laughs> Anyone else want to comment on that question? Yeah, I did think just briefly uh, to piggyback on what Suzanne said. Uh, it's not only important that we have this exchange, including the European Union and the United States. But it's essential if we're not going to leave a vacuum for China to fill. Uh, China sees uh, 5G and, and the sort of the next generation of communication as their opportunity to be the dominant player around the world. And uh, their initiatives are well underway. Uh, and we, quite frankly, haven't responded in kind. So I think this is our opportunity. And uh, it's clear that if we don't do it together, uh, China will fill that void. Well, as we have closing statements, Christelle, why don't you um, begin? Thank you very much. First of all, I think this was a really uh, great uh, discussion we had today, and I hope that we will be able to continue. And what we have learned, uh, at least in the European Parliament uh, during the COVID-19 crisis, is that it is so easy today to have webinars and meet uh, even though we don't have to be together physically. Of course, it's always nice to meet really, but it's possible also to have a good uh, exchange of view and a good dialogue. And I hope that we can intensify the dialogue between the members of the European Parliament and the United States Congress, because I think we really need to, to go into more details uh, and not even, not necessarily in, in public, but also uh, uh, in, in closed meetings. Uh, I think we need to do it. This has been a very good uh, and very interesting uh, discussion and dialogue, and I'm really looking forward to see much more of it. And I think the learnings uh, is that if we work together, we can together set the standards for the world, and that will be the best for the world, no doubt about that. Thank you very much. Andres? Well, this is marvelous what Crystal has said, although we are coming from two political families that are different. On that point, I definitely agree. Um, I, I believe very strongly that we can get it even better right uh, together if we focus uh, on the key questions and that we don't create too much bureaucracy with the laws. And therefore, I, I think that the whole issue that we are dealing with, with the Digital Markets Act and monopolies should really focus on the big companies and not on too many because we don't need more red tape. We don't need uh, innovation being hampered by bureaucracy. We need a clear focus. And you know that the American bipartisan bill comes up with the proposal that only companies with a cap market capitalization higher than 600 billion should be in the focus. I have been proposing a modest increase from 65 billion to 100 billion. So if you can align at the end, maybe at 300 billion would be a marvelous compromise. Thank you so much. Daryl? Well, uh, I, I don't want to disagree with uh, any of this. Go ahead, go ahead and disagree. Well, I, I think you have to look, if you're looking at overseeing monopolies, you can set a size because there is such a thing as, as big enough to be a monopoly. But if we're looking at a, uh, a common, open, transparent and accountable market, I think we have to recognize that a very small company, a company that might only have a few hundred million or a few million dollars in market cap can still live up to the same standards. And I'll just go back to, if you're going to be a public company in the US or in the European Union, uh, you're gonna live up to an accounting standard. I believe that as we're looking at standards for openness, transparency, uh, and certainly privacy, we need to hold anyone who enters that market, uh, certainly at the public company level, we need to hold them accountable. And so I would certainly be one of those, those people that would say, let's actually ask the question of, are you able to meet other uh, areas, even with a market cap, let's say of, uh, of $1 billion, if you can meet the other requirements, uh, such as financial reporting, which is much more burdensome 
than protecting somebody's privacy. So I do think uh, as a closing statement that holding more companies responsible gets us a more common set of rules where as we go up to less and less companies, we seem to be focusing on how to fix what we perceive are their problems rather than the broader problem. And certainly as we look at data privacy, data privacy cannot be something that only very large companies implement because anyone can scrape data today in the way that Google did just a few years ago and have a vast amount of information that many of us believe belongs to the individual. Idris, do you want to respond to that? And then we'll let Suzanne close. Well, no, I think that discussion has to be continuing. Uh, and I think the arguments of Daryl are absolutely valid. Um, but I wonder then why the US wants to have a threshold of 600 billion, if it's like he says. So I think we will have funny discussions there. And I'm convinced that in the end, we, we are linked because the values behind are what we care about together. Uh, no one should disc be discriminated. Everyone should have a chance to be successful in the digital market. Uh, and on that, we stand for together. And therefore, I have no doubt that we will get it done. Thanks. Suzanne. Um, thanks. This has been a great discussion. And I agree with everyone that we have. it has to be an ongoing discussion. It's hard when we do it in fits and starts um, because we really need to get to, um, we need to make, we're behind, I, I believe. And I think in the US, uh, maybe even more behind in terms of policy. Um, I think that Daryl basically said he agrees with my audit provision and the privacy bill. So, um, so, so that's good to hear. But I think as we talk going forward, it's going to be very important for us to think holistically about how things work for small companies and innovators, for large companies, um, how enforcement works, um, because a key part of this, of all that we're working on is also not only to uphold our values, but also for folks to have trust that, um, that a system is working for them on their behalf. And I think that's a mutual goal we all share and, and we'll continue to work towards. So thanks for doing this and bringing us all together. Well, Suzanne, I hope that the, um, the European Study Group at the former members of Congress can be a platform for more of these discussions. Uh, and Joe, uh, Joe Dunn, who uh, represents the, um, the parliamentary, dialogue, uh, parliamentary liaison office here in, in Washington, thank you for bringing together our parliamentarians. And um, stay tuned, we will continue this conversation. Out of time. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye.